Henry, don't you dare touch, ride, or even look at this brand new Epic World Cup. It's for me and me alone to test. If there is so much as a scratch on it by the time I get back, me and Mishka will beat the living shit out of you, you lemon. Hugs and kisses, Michael Levy. Bloody hell. There was a period, maybe what, four or five years ago, where everything was epic. The term, which I presume started with some cool kids somewhere, was quickly brought under the control of middle-aged marketing execs, and they just lost the plot. Suddenly, everything from coffee, bus passes and socks were epic. One thing that was first to the punch and steadfastly remained epic was, of course, the specialised stalwart. Maybe it's the perfect bike for the middle-aged marketing exec? Well, I'm not getting drawn. But what I can tell you is Specialized have come back to it, brought it out in a new package, which they hope to be the best bike for World Cup racing and, well, the Cape Epic. So this is the Specialized Epic World Cup. And the way it's positioned is quite interesting because as much as it is a full suspension bike, one could argue it's actually more of a hardtail that just so happens to have 75 mil of suspension. And Specialized have form in this area. With their Diverge gravel bike, they do something kind of similar. And their Roubaix road bike, which has a suspended assembly in that steerer. Either way, it's still a road bike. And I would maybe contend that in a weird way, this is still a hardtail. So perhaps we should dig out the name of the softtail. Well, I'm not sure, but either way, this bike is gonna be trying to be very good at the things you would hope a hardtail to be very good at. Does it look like a session? Well, no, but let's face it, it does look a trifle like the Super Calibre. This could be because of two things. It could be big bike as they smuggle secrets and dossiers between each other behind closed doors, or because it's two similar brands trying to solve similar problems using similar resources and similar technology, and they just so have happened to come up with a similar solution. I'm probably leaning towards the second one. I'm not saying that I don't love novelty or interesting or weird design solutions in our mountain bike frames, but I do think that both brands probably found themselves in similar positions, having recently shored up their more aggressive XC bikes, dare I say down country, with that epic Evo and top fuel. So when it came to make a bike that sat between you know, a hardtail and a full suspension bike. In terms of design space, if you didn't go to a pool shop, I'm not really sure where else you could go. And it's no surprise to me at least to see them share similar silhouettes. This bike does without the FSR four bar that you might associate with Specialized. And that back end uses flex stays to let the bike go into its stroke. So let's get into it. This rear suspension system gives a mere waft of 75 mil of rear travel, which is about as much as a downhill bike would use just at SAG. Now, SAG is an important topic here because this bike is meant to be run at pretty much 0% right at top out. Now, Specialized say, funnily enough, that this is almost set up at 75 mil stroke because you don't use anything at all from your body weight. It's sat right at full extension the whole time. But of course, this doesn't paint the full picture. And although one might compare it to a 100 mil travel bike that's set up with 25% sag, it's not really a fair comparison truly, because we have bikes set up at sag so the wheel can extend into holes as well as come up into its stroke as we go over bumps. Specialized have with this bike in their own words, lost their minds. And what they mean by that is not including the brain system in that rear shock, although it is still in that fork. The brain is basically an inertia valve that responds to a literal knock coming from underneath the bike to open up the compression damping to let the oil cycle. However, you can't provide that knock from the top end, so the bike should give a locked out feel when the rider is putting inputs into the bike. That rear shock is also made by rock shocks as I'm gonna scuttle like a beetle. Oh my God. Ah. So this is the rock shock SID WCID or Wicked. I'm not too sure. But Specialized say that this system can give the crispness of a hardtail and the performance of full suspension. 
you can alter the negative and positive air chambers independently, where in most shocks, they would equalize at around sag. This can mean you can basically tune the negative air chamber to set the breakaway threshold before the bike gets pushed into its stroke. Oh, so without getting too detailed, read wrong about it. When you have an air shock, there is a huge amount of preload as all that pent up pressure wants to drive the shock apart. You temper this with a smaller negative air chamber, which is basically acting in the exact opposite way, almost wanting to make the bike suck down into its stroke. So when you add your body weight, you are merely complementing the work done by that negative air chamber to make it easy to get into the stroke in a consistent and controllable manner. In fact, if you ever have had a fork or suspension unit literally suck down, it often is because that negative air chamber has become overpressurized. So is that negative air chamber gonna make you bottom out all the time? Well, not necessarily. And that's of course because as the positive chamber ramps up in terms of pressure, the negative air chamber's pressure decreases as that volume gets bigger. Specialized have been hard at work and they've recommend three different relationships between those two chambers to give three different settings. There's the no gulp, their words, not mine, the half gulp, or for the thirsty Kirsties and parchy archies out there, the full gulp. These are set at 0, 5 and 10% sag respectively and can be tuned into from that relationship with those two air chambers. Specialized say this bike has their most sophisticated carbon layup ever. And the weight of a frame with the hardware and shock is 1,765 grams, which represents a penalty probably around a kilo compared to an all out hardtail. This bike also has a little old thing called geometry, as if that even matters when you're clearly only here for the shock. It has a 66.5 degree head tube angle which is actually quite slack for a bike of this ilk and a 74.5 degree seat tube angle, which might not seem massively steep, but you've got to remember this bike isn't for winching up steep fire road climbs. This is about all day epics and twisting single track. Those seat tube angles also play into the moderate reach figures, which are quite large in my mind at least, because the combination of the slacker seat tubes and longer reaches will give an effective top tube on the longer side of things. That stretched out position will be something that probably the racers love, although it might be a bit more intimidating to a casual user. All the bikes have 430 mil stays and the sizes range from a small all the way through to extra large in the full builds, although there is a frame only in extra small. Now that frame only, of course, across all the sizes will cost not inconsiderable 6,000 US dollars. And the bikes come at a $9,000 build as well as a Pretty, out, pretty outrageous $12,000 build. Now, this bike specialized say doesn't necessarily mean the Epic Hardtail is going anywhere, but it does mean it's gonna be positioned as a better value proposition. And if you want the high end, high, 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 high spec S-Works Epic Hardtail, it's now gonna be a full suspension bike again if that makes any sense whatsoever thank you very much for watching please like and subscribe if you want to no problem if you don't but it might stop mike levy giving me such a savage beating if you at least get a few likes on the video thanks guys and we'll see you next time